What are these things? You're going to turn it on and I'm going to walk over and turn it off and you're not going to pay attention. Friends, what a beautiful way to start our worship service this morning. I'd invite you to rise as you are able and turn your attention towards the font, which is the first place we encounter Christ in our lives and where we begin our worship service this morning. And we begin as we always do in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Friends, our gathering hymn this morning is Dearest Jesus at Your Word. It's found printed on the next page of your bulletin or on the screens. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us 
and guide us in the ways of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first lesson is from Ezekiel 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel, who sins that shall die. Know that all lives are mine, the life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your way, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our responsorial psalm is Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your paths, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. A second lesson is from Philippians 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him 
and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in, the, in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say, from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say, of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. He answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. And this is the gospel of the Lord. I don't know if it's because my kids are home from school right now, doing school remotely on their Zooms, on their computers, or in the, and that we're just all together or not, but these last two weeks I have a lot of stories about my family. My wife and I have decided in the last stretch of time that we will no longer make promises to our children at all. You know what I mean? We will no longer make promises to commit to do anything for our children. So when the kids really, really want a particular meal for dinner tonight, and it was not on our plan, we will not say to them anymore, we won't say, no, we already have broccoli and chicken planned for tonight, but I promise on Friday night we'll do mom's homemade pizza. We don't do that anymore. You know why? Because Friday night gets here and the kids want Dawn's homemade pizza, which is a three and a half hour ordeal from crust making to serving it on the plate. Inevitably, when we plan that and say that we promise that we'll do it, inevitably something comes up. Dawn is held up late at work one day, or one of the kids has a pop-up commitment that makes fulfilling that promise for a homemade pizza 
really difficult or even impossible. And so when we tell them that we'll have to do it another night and we don't follow through, we are at best labeled as flip-floppers and at worst outright liars. We'll get, but you promised us. And it's not enough for us to ex explain to them, I know I said so, but now I've changed my mind and need to say no. We won't promise that a friend can come over or that we'll go kayaking tomorrow or that we'll go to Woodside Ice Cream, Woodside Farm for ice cream, or that we can go shopping for new clothes or pretty much anything because we might have to change our minds. In fact, I've even started employing that same tactic here at church because as much as I really want to come through with something that I've promised to do or really, really want to get done by a certain time, I've learned. Things happen. Circumstances change. And we're all just going to have to be flexible with that. Changing one's mind, even beyond my little example, indicates that you can't just land on an idea and never decide to revisit that idea or that principle again. Changing one's mind means that you are constantly willing to reconsider given new learning, new facts, new experiencing. Changing one's mind means giving up power and admitting that things are no longer as you once thought they were. Changing one's mind means there's a possibility you might have been wrong in the first place. The ability and the willingness to change one's mind plays at the center of this morning's gospel lesson. In response to a question by the chief priests and the elders, now this is the group that ultimately is chiefly responsible for killing Jesus, for putting him to death. In response to their question about by what authority Jesus is doing the teaching that he's doing, the teaching, by the way, which seems to overturn everything that they had been ch taught as young children, and it is everything that they continue to teach now as leaders in the church, as chief priests and elders of the temple that they're in. This has been the teaching since Moses, thousands of years. And they want to know, by what authority is Jesus teaching something different than they have heard their whole lives and frankly, for over a millennium. So in response to that, Jesus tells them a parable. He says, two sons are instructed by their father to go out into the vineyard. The first one says, no. But later he changes his mind. And he goes to do the work in the vineyard. The second one says, yes, I'll go. But he never does. And Jesus asks them, which of the two does the will of the Father? And the chief priests and the, answers, and, the, and the elders answer the first one. And they're right. And Jesus says to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. In other words, you did not revisit your actions and your beliefs and your principles and believe him. You did not consider new learning, new facts, new experiences and believe John. You did not give up your power and consider that maybe circumstances are no longer as you thought they once were. You did not consider that maybe you might have been wrong all along. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's taking the religious people, the people who run the temple in Jesus' time, and he's placing them in the position 
of the second son who said that he would go into the vineyard but did not go. I mean, yes, in other words, yes, they are doing God's work, but they're not really doing God's work. The work of the Beatitudes. Remember I talked about them last week? If not, go back and listen to that sermon too. But it's even more complicated than that. Jesus says when John the Baptist came preaching, the chief priests and the elders were preaching about a different kind of kingdom of God. John's preaching about one filled with forgiveness and love. And he says, you didn't change your mind about this new teaching. You act holy and righteous, but there really is no follow-through in terms of how your heart is changed toward other people. But it's even more complicated than that. Because remember, this is all taught in response to a question about what authority Jesus has to teach these things in the first place. And you got to wonder, why didn't Jesus just say, this is why I have authority to teach all this? Why didn't he just say, well, I have the same authority John had. John could baptize. I can teach this way as well. Or why didn't he just say, I'm the Son of God. Of course I can teach this way. I think he didn't because he was giving them a chance to change their minds. Jesus already knew which one of those two sons in the parable that he was going to equate them to. It was almost like Jesus was giving them a chance to change their mind. And they actually took a moment to think about how they would respond, right? If we say that John's baptism was from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe it? And they're thinking, should we have believed it? If we do believe it and, and change our minds... What does that mean? What kind of power, what kind of position, status, and wealth do we give up? And here's the scariest part for them. If we do change our minds, are we made equal? Go listen to my sermon from last week. Are we made equal to them? The prostitutes, the tax collectors. Jesus is right now up in their face challenging the status quo and all that these very pious people live their lives centered in. Will they change their minds as Jesus puts this parable and this question to them? And we know they won't. We know they won't. Changing one's mind indicates that you didn't just land on an idea and decide never to revisit it again. Changing one's mind means that you're constantly willing to reconsider some principle, some idea, after you've learned new facts, new experiences. Changing one's mind means giving up power and admitting things weren't like I thought. Changing one's mind means that there is a possibility that you were wrong in the first place. This lesson at its heart is about, is about challenging where you and I stand as people of God. It's about changing our mind, yes, but what it's really about is repentance because that's what repentance is. It is changing our mind, changing our hearts even. It's about confession and forgiveness and turning our lives around this lesson is. I remember as a young boy, confession and forgiveness growing up in the Catholic Church, and I often think we look at confession and forgiveness the same way I did as, as a kid. Like, I have to just confess all the bad things that I've done, hitting my brother and cussing and being mean to someone. But confession, repentance is about so much more than that it's about changing where we stand in relationship to god moving closer to god or, or better said a different way removing the impediments that keep us separated or at a comfortable status quo distance from god and instead letting god break in on our own lives no matter what that change means 
This lesson is about changing the status quo of our lives and therefore changing the status quo of other people's lives and of the world as well. That's why the the challenge in my little story at the beginning, beginning of my sermon this morning is actually tougher than we might expect at first. The impossibility of planting a flag in a particular place, of thinking one way and never wavering in that way of thinking. It means that we learn something from science, from relationships, from experience, from maturity, that we can actually change. Because it's ridiculous otherwise. I mean, we're alive and we're living. And so is the earth and so are other people. And frankly, so is God. Alive and living. And because of the living nature of everything and everyone, we have to learn to change our minds so that we are able to meet God in the least likely of places places we never thought God would be, the places we never thought God was blessing, the places we never thought were holy, in the least likely of places and people and situations. Who God is never changes. And if you listen to the daily devotions that Pastor John and I have been doing over the last few weeks, every week, John, we talk about how God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It keeps coming up. That never changes. That about God is always the same. But how we understand who that love is directed toward, that can change. How we understand who needs mercy, <laughs> that changes about every time we turn on the news. But the amazing thing in this lesson is that Jesus doesn't just take that realization and stuff it down the throats of the priests and the elders. He could have just cut them off completely. But Jesus doesn't do this to them, and he doesn't do it to us either. The good news in this lesson is that God always welcomes both sons in this parable. Did you see that? The prostitutes and the tax collectors will go into heaven Ahead of you, Jesus says. Ahead of you, not instead of you. God welcomes people whether they have said yes or no, whether they stay or whether they go. Whether you are a person who says yes and never follows through or whether your inclination is to say no, but you change your mind later. Whether you're a person who changes your mind or not, God invites us all to have our lives changed, to be welcomed into a new way of life, a life of adventure, of challenge, a life where God forgives and renews and blesses everyone. By what authority does Jesus do this teaching? In the end, it doesn't matter. What matters is that God's love and invitation to live in his kingdom is extended to everyone. Maybe the better question that they should have asked is by what authority do you and I get to be so stubborn in our opinions, so fixed and unchanging, Maybe that's the better question. Because we are all called every day to change our minds and to walk into God's vineyard so that we may be fully loved by God and so that we may love one another in God's holy name. Amen. Friends, why don't we stand and sing together, Lead Me, Guide Me.
drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your Son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn the nations toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interest of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Lord, we pray especially for Ron Henry, Russ Hokinson, Charlie Young, Danny Mason, Judy Parsons, and Sherry Thompson. We pray for Dana Hauser, Tom DeWeese, John and Barb Williams, Dave Frampton, and Ruth Bowles. We lift to you Kelly Croft, Joe and Lynn Pauser, Lois Hardy, Marge Davis, Nelson, and Diane Murray. We pray, Lord, for Trudy Gillengast, John Newcomer Sr., Del Linker, Colby Sirk and family, Lenore Hoffman, Carol Ruckel, Kevin Meinholt, Barb Hewlett, Hilda Crothers, Sharon Smith, and Stephen Benscoder and family. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, everyone in the congregation is invited to offer your own prayers either aloud or in your hearts. Thank you, Lord, for those who have gone into the kingdom ahead of us, tax collectors and prostitutes, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn. By their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share God's peace with one another, and those who are streaming with us receive our peace as well. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Philip's Lutheran Church, where our mission is to make disciples, praise God, and serve the community. Great to have you with us today. Uh, whether you're a longtime member or visitor with us, it's great to have you. Um, lots of things to announce. If you look online on our website, you can get to the bulletin uh, or on the email that we sent out where we attach it. Read through there. There are a ton of things that are going on right now, so we do hope you can join us for any number of those. Most of them are being held remotely at this point, mm -hmm. um, but um, some things I want to draw your attention to, uh, mostly John has like three of them. I have one. Uh, the first is that Lauren and Stephen are leading a, a project for our Christmas cantata this year, just kind of recognizing that that may not happen um, in person this year. They're putting together a socially distanced Christmas cantata CD um, or digital download, either one, 
So, um, so if you are interested in that, or even if you're not, we need to know because we need to know if this is a project that has legs and life. And um, so if you can um, respond to the, the, uh, the sign up that we had put out there, just getting your opinion and your feedback, please do so. It's just a little Google form. It takes all of, I think, 30 seconds to fill out overall. So uh, if you have questions about that, see me, see Stephen, Lauren. We can give you details about that, and hopefully we can make that happen. John, you have three things you want to lift up. I do. So I'm going to get off the stage. All right. Okay. We have a very busy outreach committee in the month of October. shorter uh, and given that we're going to be hosting on October 8th and October 15th from 6.30 to a uh, 17 page document uh, so if you want to uh, be part of those conversations in that study there's another sign up genius that's floating around to let people know um, who are hosting that you're if you're interested please sign up for that uh, and the last thing is we are going to be doing another food drop-off food drive for St. Stephen's. Uh, that's going to be on October 17th from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, there's a list in the second to last page of the bulletin uh, outlining about roughly the 10 items that they're looking for. Uh, so if you're interested in volunteering, there's a link for a sign-up genius. Four to six volunteers that day, but we out of people to drop off. Um, October is going to be another slow month uh, for St. Stephen's. They are continuing to donate more than they ever have before uh, in COVID times. So your generosity would be appreciated. Uh, but this would normally be the time in our service where we'd give our gifts of offering. You guys are doing an amazing job donating online, dropping things off in the basket back there, or sending in your checks to church. Uh, so we will continue with our communion liturgy. So I'd invite you to rise as you are able. 